You can't live long in this world without being wronged. How many of you have been wronged by somebody? Just lift your hand. See my point? I think every hand went up. As a pastor, I've heard all kinds of heart-wrenching stories. He had an affair. She cheated on me. He's been watching pornography. He took a pile of our savings and wasted it on gambling. My friend said he had an investment that couldn't go wrong. He lost us a ton of money. She told things about me that weren't true to all my friends. Lies. She betrayed me. He raped me. My own son, daughter, stole from me. Now let me ask you a question. Have you forgiven them? You say, are you crazy? They have an ass and I'm not about to offer. What good would it do? I will never forget what they did to me. I don't need to forgive. I need payback. After all she's done to me, you expect me to for, just forgive her? Listen to Jesus. This is part of the Lord's Prayer, maybe the best known of all Jesus' teaching. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins... Your Father will not forgive your sins. Oh my goodness. When I read this a few weeks ago in preparation for this message, I thought, I bet there's some people I haven't forgiven. And so, I don't know, I took about 20 minutes. I just named them one at a time and said, God, I forgive, you know, just kept going. Thought of people that wronged me, wronged my wife, wronged my family. Jesus says forgiveness is seriously important. Why is forgiveness so important? Lack of forgiveness keeps us trapped in bitterness and resentment. I think we grossly underestimate the true cost of holding feelings of bitterness towards someone else. Someone has hurt us and deeply and we're angry and we think we can just carry on. Bitterness extracts energy from us. It takes up head space and heart space. It hangs over us like a dark gray cloud. No one understood the cost of hanging on to anger and bitterness more than Jesus. In one of his final prayers, as he hung on the cross, Jesus forgave the very people who were killing him. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's an unbelievable prayer. Right in the midst of being wronged, Jesus forgave those who wronged him. These executioners were no choir boys. These were professional murderers. They had already beaten Jesus beyond recognition. And now they sledged crude ham nails, hammered them into his feet and his hands. As these bloodthirsty thugs stood gawking and jeering at him, Jesus was spread out on the cross, gasping for air, dripping with blood, and in the midst of it all, he forgave them. What did Jesus know about forgiveness that we don't? He knew that lack of forgiveness ruins us. It buries us in anger and resentment. That's why the Apostle Paul writes, Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, slander along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Just as in Christ, God forgave you. Or to get rid of rage and malice 
which are toxic to us. Instead, we are to forgive. Do you remember Monty Williams, assistant coach for the Portland Trailblazers? Great. He was a great, great coach. Now, then he went on to uh, head coach of uh, New Orleans uh, Pelicans. Now he's assistant coach uh, with uh, Oklahoma City Thunder, who the Blazers will probably play in the playoffs. So we'll be battling with Monty. His wife, Ingrid, 44-year-old wife, mother of his five children, was driving not too long ago. And Susanna Donaldson was doing 92 miles per hour in a 45-mile-per-hour zone. Hit her and killed her on impact. Now, Monty's a Christian. I mean, he's a strong Christian, but he went way beyond, way beyond, way beyond what anybody would expect at the memorial service. He said, hey, folks, thanks for praying for me, but you also need to pray for their Susanna Donaldson and the Donaldson family. Listen to what he said. Now, I'm going to close with this. And I think it's the most important thing that we need to understand. Everybody's praying for me and my family, which is right. But let us not forget that there were two people in this situation. And that family needs prayer as well. And we have no ill will towards that family. In my house, we have a sign that says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We cannot serve the Lord if we don't have a heart of forgiveness. That family didn't wake up wanting to hurt my wife. Life is hard. It is very hard. And that was tough. But we hold no ill will towards the Donaldson family. And we, as a group, brothers united in unity, should be praying for that family because they grieve as well. So let's not lose sight of what's important. God will work this out. My wife is in heaven. God loves us. God is love. And when we walk away from this place today, let's celebrate. Because my wife is where we all need to be. And I'm envious of that. But I got five crumb snatchers I got to deal with. <laughs> I, I love you guys for taking time out of your day to celebrate my wife. We didn't lose her. When you lose something, you can't find it. I know exactly where my wife is. I'll miss holding her hand. I'll miss talking with my wife. Um, Sam and Coach Donovan probably couldn't figure out why I always wanted to get out of the office, uh, me and Mo Cheeks. Um, Mo probably wanted to go do something else, but we always wanted to get out of the office. I just enjoy being with my wife. I enjoy being with my family. And most of the times we didn't do anything. We'd just be at the house sitting around um, doing nothing. I'm going to miss that. Let's not lose sight of what's important. God is important. What Christ did on the cross is important. Let's not lose sight of that family that also lost someone that they love. I love you guys. I hope I get a chance to hug and shake a hand and give a kiss on the cheek. But let's keep what's important at the forefront. Thank you. Both Jesus and Monty understand that lack of forgiveness keeps us in a dungeon of bitterness. Holding a grudge is like drinking poison and then hoping that the other person dies. In other words, forgiveness is for our own good. You know, half the time when you forgive someone, the other person doesn't even know they did something wrong. They've forgotten all about it. So it's just you that you're punishing. If you're withholding forgiveness from someone, I beg you for your own sake to forgive. You're hurting yourself way more than you're hurting them. When you forgive, you choose the path of healing rather than payback. Forgiveness is seriously important. There's another reason forgiveness is so important. Lack of forgiveness keeps us from receiving forgiveness from God. So let's read this again. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. He, Jesus doesn't say, for, doesn't say, forgive me on account of my forgiving others, but as I forgive others. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Oh, 
What does Jesus mean? Does he mean that if I do not forgive others, then God will not forgive me? Only God can forgive sins, and he's ready to do so when his forgiveness is sincerely wanted. But if we refuse to forgive others who wrong us, our unforgiving spirit makes us unable to receive the forgiveness God is ready to grant. Those who ask for forgiveness cannot really want it or receive it until they are ready to forgive those who wrong them. God cannot forgive and renew us in a ministry of reconciliation those who stubbornly cling to grudges, harbor, and hate and wallow in resentment. As Monty Williams said, God cannot use us in his service unless we have a heart of forgiveness. Jesus does not mean that our forgiveness earns us the right to be forgiven. It is rather that God forgives the penitent. And one of the chief evidences of penitence is a forgiving spirit. Once we see the enormity of our sin before God, the, the other things that people have done to wrong us seem trifling by comparison. When I realize all that God has forgiven me, I am ready to forgive anybody, anything. I cannot withhold it. So look at it one more time. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. The thing is absolute, inevitable. True forgiveness breaks a person, and he must forgive. Forgiveness is essential to marriage. No marriage can make it without forgiveness. Gary Chapman, in his book, The Five Love Languages, talks about how important forgiveness is to marriage. None of us is perfect. We do things uh, that are not best or right. We cannot erase the past. We can only confess it and admit that it was wrong. We can ask forgiveness and try to act differently in the future. When I've been wronged by my spouse and she has painfully confessed it, I have a choice. I have the option of justice or forgiveness. If I choose justice and want to pay her back or make her pay off, work off her wrongdoing, then I'm becoming the judge and she the felon. However, if I choose forgiveness, intimacy can be restored. Forgiveness is the way of love. I can't believe how many people mess up today by bringing in the, the sins of yesterday. They say things like, I can't believe you did that. I don't know why you deceived me. I don't think I can ever forget it. You can't possibly know how much you hurt me. I don't know how you can sit there so smugly after what you did to me. You ought to be crawling on your knees begging for my forgiveness. I don't know if I can ever forgive you. These are not the words of love, but of bitterness, resentment, revenge. The best thing we can do with failures of the past is let them be history. It may still hurt, but he has acknowledged his failure and asked you to forgive. Forgiveness is a choice to show mercy, not to hold up the offense against the offender. Forgiveness is an expression of love. I love you and I choose to forgive you. You're not a failure because you have failed. You are my spouse, and we will go forward. Forgiveness is one of the most powerful evidences that we have been forgiven by God and understand the enormity of what God has forgiven us. Lee Strobel, in his book, uh, The Case for Grace, tells one of the most amazing stories I have ever read about forgiveness. <laughs> For 1,364 days, the Khmer Rouge regime 
systematically tortured and killed millions of Cambodians. They wanted to get rid of all the educated class and make it an agrarian society. Teachers, dead. Journalists, dead. Government workers, gone. University students, dead. 11,000 university students in Cambodia in 1976, only 450 survived. Christopher Lapel was one of the educated survivors. The Khmer Rouge was trying to get him and kill him, and he got away. He ran into the jungle, and he was not a Christian, but he, he knew of Jesus. There were a, a fair number of Christians in Cambodia. More were Buddhists and, you know, non-believers, but he said, Jesus, if you save me, I will give you my life, and I will serve you the rest of my life. And somehow he got away through the jungle and he reached for the cross that hung around his neck and it was gone. Somewhere in the, the trees it, it had broken. He thought, how ironic, I lost my cross but I found Jesus. Well, Lapel did not forget Cambodia. He went back to help the country. The country had... Um, he, he had lost his uh, father and mother at work camps. One of the ways they, they killed their people were through, you know, working them to death, starving them to death. His sister was a journalist in the capital. She was murdered. His brother was killed just before the Vietnamese uh, came in and intervened, 1979. His cousin was killed at S-21. S-21 was a complex uh, that uh, was, became their chief uh, place for interrogation and ex uh, um, torture and execution. It was known as the place that people go in and they never come out. 14,000 people went into S-21. Only seven were known to ever come out. It was run by a guy named Comrade Doik. He was a mathematician. He kept meticulous records of every interrogation, torture, and execution. On one piece of paper, uh, it was a group of eight children and nine youth. He said, kill them all. On another order paper, he said, uh, use the hot method. If it kills him, no problem. In torturing people, they would, I, I hate to even tell you stuff like this, but it just tells you how horrible it is. They'd hang them upside down and dunk their heads in like buckets of urine and feces. They'd use electric cords on them and shovels and hoes to beat them. It was just, it was just terrible. When the v Vietnamese came in they, and they came into S-21 and intervened, they, they found, you know, bodies all over the place, pools of blood and all these records, uh, Comrade Doik didn't have time to destroy anything and just left. That's why we know all about this. And he left and presumably was dead. Well, Christopher Lapel came back and he uh, had a kind of a training academy, a Christian academy, and he taught people, Cambodians, about Christ. And uh, he's responsible for at least, uh, by this point, 200 churches are traced to his training. Um, and uh, one, one of his trainings, a, a guy came, a scrawny guy in mid-50s, and his name uh, came with a friend. His name was Hong Pin, and uh, he was not a Christian, but he sat through the training, and uh, every day uh, uh, Christopher would ask for people to want to give their lives to Christ and receive forgiveness, and he was surprised this day that Hong Pin stepped forward. And so he talked to him and he said, before I pray for you, is there anything you want to say? And he says, I've done some very bad things. I don't know if the brothers and sisters here can forgive me. Are you sorry? Yes. Are you remorseful for your sins? Yes. Well, God can forgive you. So he prayed for him to receive Christ and be forgiven and he baptized him the next day. He said when he came out of the water, he was just like a transformed man. He was joyful. He was 
And then from then on, he was, you know, he'd be sitting in the front row of class and he was just eating it up, everything he'd learn about Christ and the Bible. And, um, and uh, he, he went out from the class and he went back to his town. He led his children to Christ, uh, started a church, 14 families uh, joined. At one point, he went to a refugee camp of 12,000 Cambodians in Thailand and uh, helped uh, uh, Americans working there to uh, stem the tide of a typhoid epidemic, typhoid. Well, Christopher and Hong lost touch with each other until in his, uh, Christopher was at his home in Los Angeles, 1999, when he got a call from a journalist who identified herself as uh, from the Associated Press. She said, can you tell me about one of your disciples? He says, well, I've trained thousands or hundreds of people. And, uh, well, this one is kind of slender and scrawny, and he's got big ears that sit out. And he said, yeah, that's uh, Hong Pin. Yeah, I know him. He's one of our lay pastors. She said, well, he's hardline Khmer Rouge. And Christopher sat down in his home and he said, yeah, he's a, the journalist went on, he's a, he's a murderer. He was in charge of S-21. He's Comrade Doik. And he thought about all his family that was destroyed, his cousin that died there. Oh, you're kidding me. So Comrade Doik confessed everything he had done. He was very open about it. He had all these records, so we know all about that. And, and he, he gave them names of other people that need to be brought to justice. And so he, he's, he's serving out a lifetime sentence in Phnom Penh. Christopher LaPel never came face to face with Hong Pin again until uh, 2008. He'd already been in prison for nine years. He'd had a lot of time to think about what he was going to say. So he came into the prison and he said, before you say anything, I just want you to know I forgive you for all, all you did to my family. And I love you like a brother. You say, well, how could he do that so easily? It wasn't easy. He had nine years to think about what he was going to say. And he said, you know, I thought, how can I accept Christ's forgiveness for what I've done and not forgive somebody else, no matter how egregious? And he says, when I told him that I forgive him, uh, Comrade Doik cried. And I felt completely overjoyed and liberated. Christopher LaPel understood what Jesus taught, that he could not expect God to forgive him if he for, for, forgive, refused to forgive other people, even terrible criminals. Lack of forgiveness keeps us from receiving forgiveness from God. As we close, I want to ask you to do something, and this is serious. I'd like you to tell God the names of people you need to forgive. Maybe you've never done this before, but you know good and well they've wronged you and you haven't forgiven them. Just name them. Maybe they're people you've forgiven before, but I'm learning that it's a process. So maybe you've allowed thoughts to creep back into your mind and heart of, of bitterness. Well, then do it again. Forgive them one by one, for forgiveness is seriously important. Shall we pray? Every head down. Father, thank you for what you've taught us here today. Jesus, thank you for your teaching. It's strong. It's pretty clear that we need to forgive if we expect you to forgive us or expect to receive forgiveness from you. So God, we're just going to tell you some people that maybe we haven't forgiven. Would you just name them just quietly where you are?
All right, would you just uh, repeat after me a short prayer? Uh, Dear Jesus, forgive me as I forgive those who have wronged me. In Jesus' name, amen.